Hello, everyone. Welcome. Good afternoon or perhaps good morning or even good evening, depending on where you're listening from. My name is Melanie Blake and I'm the director of Classical Pursuits. I'm here today with Nella Katrupi, a longtime leader for Classical Pursuits and Worldwide Quest, and with Samantha Bodanis, marketing manager at Worldwide Quest. And we're really excited to have Nella with us today to talk about Caravaggio's self-portraits mirroring the modern gaze. Uh, Nella has led several trips to Italy for classical pursuits in the past, including to Sicily, um, a trip on Elena Ferrante's Naples leading about the My Brilliant Friend series, and then not in Italy, but um, to, uh, in uh, this one in uh, the Netherlands and France on Vincent van Gogh. She's a lawyer by training, but has a lifelong interest in literature and art and also in, in their intersection. Um, I have a couple of practical tips for everyone in just a moment. Uh, I also just wanted to remind you about some of our upcoming programs. Of course, the program we're focusing on today, our Caravaggio, relates to our upcoming trip, uh, Caravaggio in Rome and Malta. This is in May 2022. And we still have a few space spaces left on this trip. And we have several other trips uh, going ahead in the spring and fall of 2022. And we're already taking bookings for our 2023 trips. Uh, you can find information about any of these trips on the Classical Pursuits or the Worldwide Quest websites. Uh, you can give us a contact us to ask any questions about anything else you have or any questions you have. Uh, we also have an upcoming, another upcoming webinar on Paul Bowles in Morocco. And Samantha, now I'm, I think this is March 17th, but I'm suddenly forgetting. So you, she, she can correct me if it's a different date, but this is our next upcoming webinar. Um, and you'll get full information about this and all of our programs in, uh, in an email that we send you following today's, today's webinar. This webinar is being recorded and everybody who has registered will get a recording along with uh, further reading and other resources that we send you. So before I turn it over to Nella, uh, just a couple of practical pieces of practical information for today. Uh, Samantha is here the entire time, uh, ready to help with any technical problems you have. There are two, two, two main functions that will help uh, your enjoyment of today's webinar uh, that you can see in your control panel. The first one is audio. You might see either the word audio or perhaps an icon of, of an ear or a headphone. If you click on the arrow next to the word audio or click on the icon, that will open up the volume settings and you can adjust the volume as you see fit. The second function is questions. Then you'll see either the word questions or perhaps a question mark icon, again, depending on your device. Just click on that and that will open up a, a box where you can type in your question. Nella will be taking questions at the end of the program, so th throughout, pl please feel free to type in any questions you have for her. And if you are having any tech problems, you can also type those into the question box, um, and Samantha will be there to help you out. So that's it for me. I'm going to turn it over to Nella Katrupi. Welcome, Nella, and take it away. Thank you. I'm going to share my camera. And hopefully that's working now. Hi, everybody. It's, uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here with you today, spending some time talking about Caravaggio. I am going to focus on uh, the self-portraits. I just want to take a moment to thank Melanie from Classical Pursuits and Samantha from Worldwide Quest for their significant assistance in getting ready for this talk. And I want to thank you as well for being here to share some time with us. So let me uh, move this out of the way so I can manage my slides. So um, here's uh, the best known portrait of uh, Caravaggio, not painted by himself, but uh, by Ottavio Leone, who was a contemporary of his, this particular drawing. It is a drawing on paper, was done around 1621. Uh, 
I want to just uh, give a little bit of an intro here before we actually talk about the self-portraits. Uh, obviously, I've been intrigued uh, with the life and the work of uh, Michelangelo Merisi da Caravaggio, that's his proper name, for many years now. I began uh, thinking about, uh, you know, where does this fascination really lie? And I realized it had a lot to do with his unique approach to a lot of the conventional themes of Western art. So, of course, you know, mythology comes to mind, the Bible, the lives of the saints. But somehow he made the conventional, you know, the trite, the, the uh, tired and overworn come new again, come fresh, different, important. So how did he do it? That's, that's the question I asked myself. And I came to see that some of the aspects of his work that led to his rejection and vilification in his own lifetime and after were actually the things about his work that I found most captivating and revealing. His preoccupations with, you know, what to do with, with art, what art was about, uh, how art should be conducted, how, what it should display, uh, you know, what, what it should try to do, to do. Uh, these uh, suggested so much to me about the man himself and, uh, and helped to uh, illuminate my understanding of his works. So he was literate. He did have a few books among his possessions and his paintings. Some of them especially suggest a pretty close reading of the Bible, of uh, religious and other texts. But he didn't leave us any documentation. No letters, no notebooks. You know, I'm thinking here in contrast to Van Gogh, whose, whose letters I used uh, as the subject matter for the Van Gogh trip. So um, most of his works indeed are unsigned. So his only personal record, the primary material of his life in, in many senses, are his paintings, which currently number around 50. Amazing, right? You'd think there would be a lot more than that. There may be a few more that emerge as the uh, work of identification and attribution continues, but so far it's around that number. His fame uh, clearly has risen to the very top in terms of critical attention, thanks in large part to the pioneering work of Roberto Longhi in uh, the early 20th century. He's a, an art historian, uh, deceased now. But up until that time, really, um, uh, Caravaggio was, was not discussed very much. Um, and uh, notwithstanding the fact that there have been many Caravaggisti who have helped to demystify a lot about his life and work in the intervening years, there are still many, many, many unanswered questions. So here's a quote that sums it up. This is uh, from uh, one of the uh, contemporary art critics, quote, he who had put the oscuro into chiaroscuro was himself wreathed in obscurity. And a lot of that obscurity still remains. There's still so many questions. Um, so uh, there have been a lot of discoveries. Uh, the term that has, that has been coined is the Caravaggio disease or obsession of the last uh, less than 100 years or so. Um, we've reclaimed a number of, of previously lost works, and interestingly, we also have unearthed some really interesting documentary evidence uh, from various archives, um, especially in Italy, of course, where, where he lived and worked. So we do now have uh, new information about his travels, his, his scandals, of which there were many, his trials, legal and otherwise, and his many, many tribulations. You'll note later on in the second last slide that I've suggested some readings for you if you'd like to pursue the topic further. Uh, the travel program that we've developed uh, uh, at Classical Pursuits with Worldwide Quest, um, that's called the first Caravaggio, the first modern artist, will take a, a broader sort of view of his work and life in general, but also ask the question, why does he appeal to us in the modern world? And that's partly a question I will address today as well. So, um, so we are going to turn now to, uh, to the self-portraits, not just uh, because it's a fascinating subject matter and because they are executed with the usual mastery uh, and skill, but also because uh, they represent um, the artist's explicit exploration and portrayal of himself. In a sense, it's a, it, they represent a kind of veiled autobiography. So when Caravaggio turns uh, his gaze towards and reproduces his own image, what does he see? What does he want us to see? 
And what was he trying to say? These are the questions that I'll be asking and trying to answer to some extent today. So before we turn to Caravaggio, I just want to say a few words about self-portraits in general, um, just as a little bit of a frame. Um, Caravaggio, of course, was not uh, the innovator of uh, self, uh, the self as a subject in art, although he certainly brought his own personal stamp to it, uh, as did this guy, Norman Rockwell, more recently. Uh, art history tells us that from earliest antiquity before the first millennium BCE, in the case of Egypt, for example, whether in Eastern or Western uh, artistic traditions, attempts at self-representation were already being made. This one is from the UK, dating from around the 1100s, and it shows a scribe, um, a scribe showing himself at work in that self-mirroring loop of the self-portrait. This one here is uh, Miyamoto Musashi, uh, uh, his self-portrait, as you can tell from the weaponry uh, at hand. He was a samurai as well as a writer, an artist, and it dates back from around 1640. In Europe, it wasn't until the mid-1400s that the practice of self-portraiture really took off. And this was uh, in, in significant part because uh, mirrors were becoming more prevalent and because their quality was improved. Uh, so obviously uh, they facilitated self-representation significantly. Uh, of course though, a human fascination with self-reflection is an ancient one. Uh, the myth of Narcissus, a very ancient myth, underscores this, but so do all the selfies that we're all taking these days. So the fascination continues. Uh, uh, here we see that uh, self-portraits uh, became increasingly common in the form of single-person formal portraits. This is an early juror um, um, from around the 1500s. Um, and then think, too, of the over 100 Rembrandt self-depictions that came 100 years later. Remember that many of these professional artists earned their keep uh, from painting formal portraits in a pre-photography era. So the promotional aspect of many of these self-portraits shouldn't be uh, overlooked. In the Western tradition, the artist's uh, self-images have often been inserted into group settings or, or tableaus, set pieces depicting mythological, historical, and of course, religious themes, as in this Botticelli uh, from around 1475. Notice at the far right side, you'll notice a figure in brown looking straight at you, uh, or maybe he was looking straight at the mirror that he was using to paint himself into uh, the tableau. This is, of course, a self-portrait of Botticelli himself. Examples of later artists who followed in the tradition are many, and I'm sure you have a number in mind yourself. Maybe Van Gogh, who painted 36 portraits out of the over 900 uh, works that he produced in the short space of 10 years. Or maybe you're thinking of this artist, Frida Kahlo. Um, she painted 55 self-portraits out of a total of 143 paintings. This is not one you see often. I think it's fascinating. And the practice continues today. Uh, you may recognize uh, this iconic uh, image of the Fathers of Confederation. Uh, this is Kent Monkman's uh, take on it, uh, entitled The Daddies. And uh, you may notice that um, uh, the nude uh, self-portrait of Kent Monkman is sitting on a recognizable blanket very trademarked blanket, the Hudson's Bay blanket, and I'm sure that his position on the blanket has a significant uh, messaging for him. Uh, he is, of course, an Indigenous Cree artist uh, here in Canada. So the tradition continues. Um, this is just a slide with some of the key uh, dates um, in uh, Caravaggio's life, and were produced during those periods, some of which we'll, we'll examine, of course. But uh, while you're having a look at these uh, dates and, and works, I just want to give you a brief quote from 
Jonathan Har's The Lost Painting, The Quest for Car the Caravaggio Masterpiece, that sums up Caravaggio's life quite well. Just give me a moment to have a sip. Quote, the artist was Caravaggio, a master of the Italian Baroque. He was a genius, a revolutionary painter, a man beset by personal demons. 400 years ago, he drank and brawled in the taverns and streets of Rome, moving from one rooming house to another, constantly in and out of jail, all the while painting works of transcendent emotional and visual power. He rose from a obscurity to fame and wealth, but success did, did not alter his violent temperament. His rage finally led him to commit murder, forcing him to flee Rome, a hunted man. He died young, alone, and under strange circumstances." End of quote. Of course, he also left us indelible statements of who he was in the 50 or so works that uh, we've unearthed to date, including the ones we're going to examine today. And here is the first one. Sick Bacchus. Um, he painted this work um, in 1593 during his early, really difficult years in Rome as a young Milanese uh, painter. He was often hungry, sick, and had, just prior to painting this work, spent a long stint in a hospital. Was it an injury? Was it malaria? Was it venereal disease? We don't know. It could have been any of the above. The painting is full of contradictions. A kind of uh, a mocking irony is also present here. Uh, and the subject matter is clearly classical, right? We have the depiction of the, the deity of Bacchus that has been uh, undertaken countless, countless times by the time Caravaggio came to it. And it is, of course, a depiction of Dionysus, the Greek name, the god of wine, of revelry, of sexual abandon and fertility. So the classical tropes are all in place here. You see the grapes, you see the robe, you see the ivy wreath on the head. So where is the idealized figure of male beauty? This is not it, right? Um, we do see an, a more conventional uh, port, a Bacchus portrait in a painting he, he carried out later where uh, his, his friend and fellow artist Mario Miniti was the model rather than himself, as is the case here. Um, and in that one, you have uh, a much more generous display of um, of still life fruit and foliage and, and plant life, unlike the paltry two bunches of grapes and two soul peaches that we see here, which are in keeping right with the depiction of the god. What we have here, of course, is not a deity, but a sick street urchin, one used to posing seductively for customers, as he seems to be miming here in a darkly humorous way, he the artist, of course. The nails are dirty, the legs are splayed out, the face is gray, the lips are bluish, and the look in his eyes seems to say, yes, I would like to eat these grapes, but so sorry, I just can't, they're too sour and I'm too sick. There is a slight smile, there's humor in this painting, of course. There's a slight smile, but it's not so much inviting as shy and unsure. And the sad would be alluring eyes uh, turned to a far corner, not gazing at us, but possibly at the mirror that he was checking as he laid on the thick paint in what became his customary fashion without any preliminary drawings. So, of course, Caravaggio is famous for his particular brand of chiaroscuro, light and dark. Uh, which has been called tenebrism uh, because it's so deep, so dark, so very black. And we have a perfect example of it here in the background. But he's also known for his meticulous control of the contrasting light uh, patches. Uh, although usually there's very little blue in Caravaggio's work. We don't see skies and we don't see the sun. Uh, we see, we don't often see the source of illumination either, right? There's light and it's shining on particular things that he wants to highlight. Here, it's the pitiable face, of course, and the upper back, shoulder, and upper right arm. 
Um, he frequently focuses on this part of the male anatomy, uh, and in, as in this case, it's often for erogenous or sensual reasons, but also in the case here and in many others, to emphasize the three-dimensionality of, of, the, of the figure, to make it pop out from the background, and to create a kind of forward movement and depth in the, in the canvas. So the face has a rakish look. Uh, there's a little bit of mockery, self-mockery going on here. Um, and some have linked this, his first sort of full self-portrait, uh, as a sly way of breaking out of the trap of uh, hack uh, still life paintings that uh, he was still performing during those first years of uh, Roman servitude to other, as he no doubt recognized, uh, uh, lesser artists. I don't know, as I look at this painting, what uh, speaks out to me is the pathos and the courage of this ill, struggling young artist, applying his trade, using his own pain, and, and in this case, ugliness, to deliberately show the real behind the received allure of the conventional, idealized figure. He recorded what he saw in life, what he saw in the mirror, what he saw in himself and in the world around him, he insisted on keeping the age spots in the fruit, the dried leaves on the vine. He rejected the hypocrisy and meaninglessness of nature portrayed as paradise. So this painting, uh, from 1595 is similarly small in size. They're both around two by two, uh, give or take. It's the second self-portrait composed during his early years in Rome. This one produced in, uh, during the time that he was with one of the many church-based patrons he was to work for, in this case, uh, a cardinal named Pucci. Pucci. This work, uh, as you can see, is very dramatic. It's regarded as radically innovative, uh, mainly because of the temporal freezing of the action on the campus, the gestures and so on, the expressions. It captures a critical uh, psychology or a psychological state in, in a particular moment in time, and it freezes us there. It's a technique that he used a lot uh, going forward. Uh, but maybe you're asking yourself, but don't all paintings do that? Don't they freeze time in a particular moment? And of course, the answer is, in a sense, yes. But but what is notable, and, uh, and we see it in many of Caravaggio's works, it's, it's kind of one of his signatures, is that he exaggerates the emotional intensity of the moment in a way that forces us to stand back and admire his artistry. We don't lose ourselves in the picture. We, we are, are forced to uh, pay attention to the fact that this is indeed a work of art, and that it was composed, it was created, and, and therefore we pay some closer attention to the elements in the painting. So we see the pleated brow, we see the popping out eyes, we see the open mouth, we see the moving hands, the one held up in shock, the other recoiling in pain and disgust. All of this explicitly calls attention to the artist's netting, capturing of this particular split second in time and managing with his, with his skill to, to give us that moment fully. So we've been po uh, forced to move beyond uh, the scene to an admiration of how the scene has been represented on the canvas, right? Um, and uh, we're reminded, of course, of the artist who created this composition and whose face, to take it to a second level, is actually the face that we're looking at uh, in, in the image. So just a few other things to notice in this painting. Uh, uh, Caravaggio, of course, was the master of still life painting, but he was, uh, you know, he did not consider that the epitome. The epitome was the human fit form, the human face. Uh, but we see signs of that mastery here. And of course, a lot of it has to do with his use of reflection on glass and so on. So we have the mirrored reflection here on the glass vase and the reflective effects of the water droplets uh, misting uh, its exterior. Uh, the quality of the light is again carefully controlled. He contrasts the warm tones of the boy's face and again that exposed shoulder. 
against the cool uh, blue-gray light on the vase and notice the reflection in the glass of the um, unseen source of light, the window. There's also an element of play here uh, in that the lizard in, of the title that causes the drama to happen. Uh, and by the way, the, the lizard was seen back then as a symbol of the penis, right? So it's a, the, it's, it has a symbolic function, but it's in shadow. It's barely visible amidst the fruits. I don't know if you can find it there yourself. Obviously, it's attached to the finger of the right hand. Um, so we actually have to puzzle out uh, the, the reason for the boy's reaction as our eyes zigzag back and forth between the two main areas of light on the canvas. So there's play here, there's theater, there's the whole tableau as a kind of bravura performance by a gloating artist, right, who's in the leading role. And note, the flower behind the ear, uh, the lizard, and the uh, exposed shoulder all suggest that the role that he's playing here is that of a young male prostitute. That is how this would have been understood in his day. So you've probably seen representations of, of this image, uh, the Medusa, um, the well-connected Cardinal Francesco Maria del Monte was one of Caravaggio's principal patrons and the one who probably most helped him achieve fame and financial stability as an artist. It was he who asked Caravaggio to create this work uh, uh, on a shield. The, the painting is actually affixed to the shield itself as a gift for the Grand Duke of Tuscany. As in the previous painting, he chooses, uh, the artist chooses the most climactic, intense moment in the story, the instant here where Perseus has beheaded Medusa and she stares in horror at her own reflection, trapped in her own gaze in the mirror uh, shield of Perseus. So um, the horror uh, of the snake infested head that we see and whose face, of course, bears Caravaggio's own distorted feature is magnified through mul multiplied reflection, right, as, as we interpret the image. So there's the horror of the image itself, the head itself with the snakes, horror of the trap that the Medusa has just realized that, that she's in, of the end that is, that is coming, of the petrification that she has imposed on herself by gazing at her reflection in the shield, and the fact that it's going to be immortalized for all time. So what does this do to us, the spectator? So in us, the horror rebounds again, right? Uh, rebounds from the disgust at the snake-topped, severed, and bleeding head, at Medusa's shock and being reflected in the unseen shield that is a mirror, uh, to her recognition of her own petrification and her petrifying gaze, to her realization that her end is imminent, and as she stares out uh, at us from the shield, we too freeze in horror and, and in admiration, right? We see the artist's cleverness in setting up this chain of uh, self-reflections, and we realize with irony that Caravaggio is setting up one more turn of the screw, his distorted reflection on, on, on this, his work of art, will last longer, much longer than his own face and body the will, right? So it is a kind of immortalization of him as an artist. So he's, he's, he's stolen uh, the Medusa theme and used it as a way to draw attention to his own, uh, uh, his own mastery of the art form. Um, so this is the David and Goliath, again, probably one of his better known paintings. You've probably seen representations of it before. It's, uh, it's a large, larger piece, four by three or so feet. And of course, uh, the depiction of Goliath's head after the beheading by David begs for some comparisons uh, to the Medusa portrait. So we have the severed heads, we have the dripping blood, uh, we have the features that are definitely the features of the artist, uh, the open mouth, the furrowed brow. In this case, they're older, they're more wrinkled, they're in ruin, we might say, but still they are recognizably Caravaggio's features. 
Temporally, he's again stopped the clock at that instant just before uh, consciousness is snuffed out. So there's knowledge, as in the Medusa, that the end is at hand and unavoidable. The features are on their way to settling into the rigidity of the death mask. And the fact that one eye is still uh, gazing out, is still glaring, while the other one is almost shuttered, underscores this, this kind of crossing over uh, moment that has been captured here. So, you know, it's easy enough to believe that in this depiction, Caravaggio, who was by now on the lamb from a death sentence, was projecting uh, terror over his own long evaded and still pending capture and beheading for murder. However, let's again note the difference between this portrait and that of the Medusa. What we have here are two figures, not one, two persons, not one. So the painting forces us to make a comparison between these two figures that are here. And of course, that, that contrast is explicit and, and very much intentional. So we have the two highly uh, illuminated forms starkly framed against the usual uh, dark uh, black backdrop. Um, there, uh, we, we see the contrast in their expressions, their physical traits, their attitudes, their feelings. We have the grace, health, and beauty of the youthful uh, David held up against the, the gloomy, ravaged face of the dying older man. We have this, the expression on the David is really interesting. It's, it's sorrowful, it's calm, it's pitying, uh, mm -hmm. and he is tilting his head in sympathy towards that grotesque head that he's holding out far away from his body and his slender, you know, still youthful and, and not very strong grasp. That set over against the sunken, vanquished gaze of Goliath. He's, the gaze is turned away from the boy and caught up in its own pain, regret, and possibly, uh, given that it's a self-portrait here, uh, of eternal damnation. So there are deep feelings reeling uh, here in this portrait. And knowing that the model for David was Cecco del Caravaggio, as he was often described by the biographers, the early biographers, that is uh, Caravaggio's Cecco, uh, namely Francesco Boneri, who modeled extensively for Caravaggio in the early 1600s and had a close ongoing relationship with him, supports this observation about the, the emotional dynamic that's going on here. The sword slashing a diagonal from David's lowered right hand signals the sexual nature of the relationship and uh, Caravaggio's increasingly desperate fear for his life and its former joys, his exhausted attempts to evade captivity. He left Rome, went to Naples, went to Sicily, went to Malta, came back to Sicily, back to Naples, are documenting uh, the profound psychological defeat that uh, that he was experiencing and obviously this is bringing new meaning irony and sympathy to this uh, well trampled theme of david vanquishing goliath so some have suggested that this was a mea culpa type of attempt to gain uh, uh, to again try and gain official pardon for the murder um, of uh, his rival Tomasone, and, and so it may have been but but you know uh, there's something else going on here that's tapping into deep psychological and moral terrain and i think that's what really speaks to us today uh, it's it's what i feel is timeless real and true in the depiction uh, we have in front of us here so um let me get another sip sorry I taught for three hours this morning, so my throat is a little parched. So um, you'll notice that most of the images we've looked at so far from Caravaggio are based on secular themes. Uh, he focused the later part of his career when he was very successful and was working for churches and aristocrats and so on. Um, Primarily, the work of this period is based on religious subjects, and uh, often these are large-scale, multi-piece panels for cathedrals and, and private chapels and so on. 
Uh, by the early 1600s, he had reached the pinnacle of his artistic achievement, um, despite having had uh, more than his share of enemies and critics, he was increasingly sought out by the rich and powerful. Excuse me a moment. So um, I want to um, examine a few of these religious works. Um, and uh, the fact that, uh, that uh, Caravaggio has introduced himself into these tableaus, uh, not as a principal character, but as a character in the scene nonetheless. In other words, he's not a passive observer as was Botticelli in the, the scene we looked at before. Uh, but as you can see here in the far right hand side, he's there as part of the drama, right? So this one um, is, um, was produced in the early 1600s, around 1602, 1603. Um, it, it is, it has been identified and confirmed as the original among many existing copies. It came to light recently in the early 1990s in Dublin um, after a, uh, a, an erroneous attribution to a Dutch artist. So clearly what you have here is the kiss the betrayal by Judas and uh, the depiction of Jesus is very interesting here. Um, his, his gaze is downward um, and it's almost as if he's a kind of a humble and silent center in the eye of a storm. You'll notice how compacted the scene is, how, how tight all the figures are together. Um, and uh, But what I want to focus on, of course, is the way Caravaggio introduces himself into the scene. So if you look at his face on the far right, uh, you'll see that it's wedged between three uh, heavily armored soldiers. Uh, his face is brightly illuminated, as strongly illuminated as the face of Christ. In fact, notice the highest point in the work is his hand, the hand of Caravaggio, of the Caravaggio figure. He's holding up a lantern. And uh, of course, this is uh, a, a source of illumination and, and symbolic, but it's also actually taken explicitly from a reference to lanterns being used at the scene in, in the Gospel of John. So this light has been interpreted by some as um, uh, uh, um, the reflection by Caravaggio of, uh, of his own worth as an artist, a kind of defense of, of uh, the way he uses light and creates art, uh, a celebration, if you will, of his, of his own method. And there were many disputes with others that uh, were, were around this topic. He, he was indeed entangled in uh, violent uh, fights with other artists. There are transcripts from legal proceedings, including a libel. Uh, suit against him that attest to the very volatile and heated uh, arguments that took place around artistic method and artistic worth, right, uh, of the artist uh, and, and the artist's method. So um, we have some interesting testimony uh, from these trials, and Caravaggio's testimony uh, conveys the uh, really offensive, insulting, and heated uh, way that these exchanges took place. Um, and uh, we can well imagine uh, that violence would be a part of this. Um, so interesting, though. Look, this is about this is a violent scene. There's a betrayal taking place. The tragedy is inevitably going to follow. But look at the expression on, on the face of Caravaggio's figure here. It's serene. It's serious. But, um, you know, contrast it to the figure on the far left, uh, which some have said is possibly St. John howling, screaming, and fleeing uh, away, uh, you know, in extreme uh, emotional upset. That's not the look on Caravaggio, the Caravaggio's figure face. He's holding up the light. He seems to be appraising the scene before him, almost with a kind of quiet satisfaction, in fact. Right? So I tried very hard to make sure that I included in, in the images we were going to look at, one that, that has women, in fact, Caravaggio, 
painted many uh, astounding portraits of female heroism. I'm sure you've seen, uh, you've, some of them are, are extremely famous and well known. Uh, this was his last uh, work. This is the Martyrdom of St. Ursula. Um, and it, took, it was carried out in Naples in the spring of 1610, shortly, shortly before his death. It was on a commission from a wealthy Genoese aristocrat. And notice, right, the pose um, and the position of the artist's cameo portrait behind the saint here is almost identical to the placement in the taking of Christ, the, the earlier one. This is eight years later, though and uh, produced under very, very different circumstances. So despite the superficial similarities, <coughs> Caravaggio is mirroring himself here not as a celebrated artist at the height of his powers, shining a light on his own face and his own work. Rather, it's, it's, it's a mask of death, right? His face is deathly pale. The light is not soft and, and glowing with warmth as in the previous scene. Um, instead, uh, what we have here is a portrayal of sorrow. The saint has just been uh, injured by her ravager. She has a, an arrow in her breast. Uh, she can barely believe herself what she's looking at, but she's calm, right? She's calm. And uh, it's not her face that, that seems to evoke and mirror death, but rather the face of uh, that Caravaggio figure behind her. His head is thrown back, the eyes are almost closed, the mouth is slack, and the skin is like parchment. So, again, with his unstinting honesty and directness, he's put his own fall from grace uh, uh, before us and, uh, and reminding himself and us of the flimsiness of our hold on life. So just a few comments in conclusion here. <clears throat> the gaze we experience in these paintings is that of the artist. Instead of a signature, his face, his eyes and hands are there to remind us where these disturbing, riveting works came from. His presence in the frame, his gaze, his posture are there to bring out the fact that the work is a result of his efforts, of his choices, of his <coughs> mastery of the art. It's an authorial insistence on presence in the works themselves that's rare, um, certainly among artists of his day. So how much more explicit could his message be? I gave my, I gave, I myself gave you a Medusa just before she petrified herself so that you too could share like me in the knowledge of that horror. I myself who suffered and sinned offered my head and my soul to you in my paintings, just like a felled Goliath. I who sabotaged my own life and then ran desperately from death gave you Lazarus here, as you see, just as he raised his hand so that you too could believe in the possibility of redemption, just as my raised eyes, do you see his, his head here? Just above the outstretched arm of Christ, there's one head that's gazing away from the scene to the left. And um, um, uh, below it, you'll see his hands clasped in prayer. So we have a figure here of Caravaggio looking towards the light source, uh, his hands clasped. And um, uh, obviously, there's a plea here for redemption uh, that uh, we are sharing in. So he left us the shocking and uh, uncompromising clarity of his gaze. He held up for us to see in an age, you know, of mannerism, the mannerism with the idealized, uh, fluffy, pretty images of paradise. Um, that's not what he, what he reflected to us. He held up for us to see the profanity, the rot, the brutality, the skin, the soul, and the stuff of life uh, itself. He did it in his way, on his own terms, and with remarkable originality, courage, and skill. And he made darn sure to remind us of his generosity in sharing this with us, because over and over again, he steps into the frame, he takes a good hard look around, knowing that we'd be watching. 
he was always very sure of his own level of expertise. So I'd like to close my talk here with a short quote from a very admirable and not too lengthy biography written by Francine Prose. It's in uh, um, the uh, slide that I will show you in a moment, um, containing some suggested readings. And her line, which I think captures it very well, is, quote, Caravaggio was a preternaturally modern artist who was obliged to wait for the world to become as modern as he was. So thank you for your attention. Here are some suggested readings, and uh, I believe we have time now for questions, right, Mel? Yes, that's right. Um, just going to get myself organized here. Thank you, Nella. Thank you so much. That was that was fascinating. I especially loved your discussion of David and Goliath. Um, thank you. Uh, yeah, I really enjoyed that. Okay, there I am. I couldn't couldn't find the button. Thank you so much, Nella. Um, yes, we do have. Uh, we're going to take questions. I'm just getting my screen organized here. And uh, while I do that, everyone, just a reminder: if this has inspired you to go to Rome and Malta to see some of these paintings, uh, we welcome you on our trip um, in May May 15th to 25th. We're happy to tell you about all the health and safety precautions that are a part of all of our 2022 trips um, and more about the trip itself. And uh, as I mentioned, there will be a recording of, of Nella's presentation that you'll all receive along with resources, including the further readings that Nella recommends. Um, so you can expect that um, at, at, uh, by, about Monday. Um, so let's go ahead with the questions. Um, and please go ahead, uh, type in your questions to the question box and we'll start with a question from Christine. She actually has a couple. Um, she wants to know first who commissioned the Medusa shield painting that you talked about, Nella? It was Cardinal Del Monte who was uh, again as I mentioned earlier one of the chief patrons, the church related patrons of Caravaggio and he had very close connections with the powers that be from Tuscany and this was uh, a gift that he wanted to make to I believe his title was the Archduke of Tuscany who was one of the Medici of course. Ferdinand the first was his name. Okay thanks. And Christine also would like to know um, how we can find out where um, where Caravaggio's various paintings are located. Um, there is a site um, that if you just Google Caravaggio paintings, uh, there's a site called Caravaggio.org, I believe. But there are many places where you can get this information. The Wikipedia entry on Caravaggio is pretty good. Uh, if you noticed, I included the Peter Robb book in the suggested readings. That's actually the text that we're uh, recommending for the trip, which will be discussed during the trip. Um, he also has a very useful list of the paintings at the back of the book with their location as well. So it won't be hard to, to get that information. And we can include this in the follow-up email. Um, and some of the places, for example, um, on the trip we'll go to Santa Maria del Popolo, which has, uh, Nella, I believe the martyrdom the Crucifixion of St. Peter, and um, there's one other one that's escaping me at the moment. Um, oh, Saint, uh, the Conversion of St. Paul in Santa Maria del Popolo, and um, and then in a, a church in Rome, and then San Luigi de Franceschi has right. um, uh, the um, uh, Calling of St. Matthew, just to right. name the, 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 the triptych. Uh, there are three panels of, of St. Matthew paintings there that are really amazing. So, well, you know, one quick uh, uh, way to get some information here is just to look at the classical pursuits description of the trip, because I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Mel, correct me if I'm wrong, that there, it does uh, uh, list the paintings we'll be seeing and where. So that's, that's also a start, I think. Yeah, thanks, Nella. Um, we have a couple, a, sh a couple of shout outs to Nella from uh, from Ann Sophia. Nell, I know you know Ann, just remembering with fondness uh, other travels with you. Um, and Nell, I had a question. You said yes. Caravaggio did not do any preparatory drawings. No. So, 
like <laughs> pretty amazing, right? How, how would he create a painting? So um, can you see this book that I'm holding up? Uh, raise it up a little bit more. Yeah. Okay. So this is the Jonathan Haar uh, book, um, which is, it reads like a novel, but it's the description of how um, the taking of Christ painting that we looked at was rediscovered. It actually is a fascinating story. Uh, it has a lot in it about, um, uh, you know, the refurbishment and identification of paintings. This painting, as I said earlier, had been ascribed to a Dutch artist, and it ended up being sold uh, to a Scotsman. The Scotsman eventually, I think, sold it to an Irish family. The Irish family eventually gave it to the Jesuits. <laughs> and um, it was an Italian restor art restorer who worked at the National Gallery in Dublin that who reckoned when he was called in by the Jesuits to clean this painting that they'd had hanging in the dining room collecting dust, um, it was he who recognized that, that it was uh, uh, probably a Caravaggio. And so uh, this is, if you're interested in the technical side of, of uh, art restoration and painting, this, this uh, little book is, is very good and very readable. But essentially, um, he would use score, he would paint like he had the image in his head. And, and 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 remember, he had models, right? He would recreate that scene in his studio, and his models would be holding their poses. There's a one of the things I didn't talk about just because of lack of time is that he's been very uh, important to a number of contemporary filmmakers, including Martin Scorsese. So. Um, uh, Martin uh, Scorsese actually, uh, there's at the uh, back, at the end of the Graham Dixon, is that his name? I always get his name wrong. Uh, it's, it's listed in, uh, in my, uh, my suggested readings here. Do I have? Yeah, his name is Andrew Graham Dixon. Uh, and uh, his book is called Caravaggio, A Life Sacred and Profane. In the very last chapter of that book, he talks about uh, why Caravaggio is so important to modern filmmakers. And there's a very interesting description there of, um, uh, of, of Martin Scorsese actually saying that when he made Taxi Driver, he was really inspired by Caravaggio's uh, use of ordinary people. Of course, he scandalized his contemporaries. He used prostitutes as his models for the Madonna, right? Uh, so uh, the, the way that that insistence on using ordinary people in his paintings as models and then you know, creating the scene and then working from life, if you will, once he recreated the scene was his process. There, the, the, um, uh, the Har book talks about score marks that he would use. Once in a while, he would use the end of his brush to put a guideline uh, right into the paint on the canvas to remind himself that something was there, the edge of, a, the edge of, a, of an arm or uh, the outline of a face, and he would use that as a guide. But there were no preliminary sketches no preliminary drawings, and there are many pentimenti. Pentimento is an Italian word that means regret, and what essentially what the term, it's now become part of the Caravaggio vocabulary, but what is, it refers to is his corrections. Uh, you can actually see where he's uh, put in uh, something and then corrected it, and you can see the, the remnants of that original line um, or edge of paint in the paintings. So uh, that if you're interested in that aspect of his work, that, that little book is, is very useful. Wow, that's fascinating. Wow. Yeah. Now, you know, I didn't, I'm thinking now about, um, you know, when you mentioned Martin about, for example, Goodfellas, right? Like I, I have, I didn't make the connection before, but uh, between Martin Scorsese and Caravaggio, but uh, now I, I see it. Fascinating. Yeah. There's actually, um, there's a quote from Martin Scorsese that's really interesting and, and ties into Caravaggio. Uh, when he first made his first film, his, his parish priest back in New York, uh, he went to his parish priest and he said, what did you think of it? And the parish priest said, too much Good Friday, not enough Easter Sunday. <laughs> and uh, one, of the, one of the expressions that has been used to, to describe Caravaggio's work is, it's either carnival time or it's Lent. So you get the sense of, of the parallels between the two artists. Wow. Um, a quick practical question from, from Bobby. Can you just say, Nella, again, Hi, both, Bobby. His, uh, both his, um, uh, his, his given name and then, and then 
pronounce for us again his Caravaggio as he's as he's known. Okay, so his his name is his actual name was Michel Angelo Merisi. Merisi was his last his family name, um, and uh, and and when people were describing him uh, as was conventional back then, they would also say where he was from. He was uh, th there. There's some. Uh, uh, a lack of clarity around whether or not he was born in the town of Caravaggio or in Milan. The family had connections and so either is possible and of course he was born during a plague time as well. So his actual legal name is Michelangelo, like the other Michelangelo who was very important in his life. Michelangelo Merisi da from Caravaggio. Does that help? Um, yeah, Bobby, let us know if that helps. Um, thank, thank you, Nella. That um, a couple, a, a, another a different topic, but another sort of practical question from June. Um, he says, "I don't understand how he's running away from the authorities at the same time he is receiving commissions." Right. So um, the uh, the authority. So remember, Italy was not unified at this time. So there were city governments and there were local rulers of the different city states. Uh, his uh, transgressions and crimes were committed in various places, but the murder of um, of Tommasone. Um, uh, who was a friend and then they ended up in a brawl some say over a woman some say over something else i mean he beat up people because he didn't like the way they cooked artichokes for him right he, he had a he had a temper kind of a joke um so um in this case uh, he was condemned uh, by the uh, authorities in rome and the pope would have been actually the the head of state at that time and um so there was the 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 papal authorities who would have to get, grant him a pardon so there was he was also very well connected the colonna family which was also connected to the other michelangelo um, and were based in Milan, but had holdings. And remember, the Spaniards were in Italy during this time, uh, controlling various parts of the boot. Um, and he was well connected to some of these, uh, you know, wealthy, powerful people, and they helped him a lot in terms of escaping, in terms of uh, providing commissions that would uh, guarantee him some some income. Um, they helped. Uh, uh, you know, he, he was in Malta for a time and again got into trouble after having been made a knight of the Order of Malta. Uh, he offended somebody, ended up in jail, and again he was assisted by others to escape. So at the same time that he got into trouble and made enemies, he also had friends who were loyal and who would help him out when he got into a pickle and that's how he was able to evade uh, capture for so long and by the way you know i mentioned briefly that he died uh, you know alone and uh, ill um, he finally was granted a pardon his connections did their work and they finally got him a pardon he was on his way back to rome from naples uh, in a small boat with some paintings and uh, was making his way back, but he again was very ill. And for a while, the theory was that he had syphilis, um, that he caught malaria. Um, eventually, I, I do believe that they have managed to identify some uh, matter, you know, biological matter. Uh, and uh, the latest I saw in, in an article was that they had determined from that uh, material that. He did, in fact, die of an infection. Probably, um, he had been attacked while he was in Naples, and uh, probably the, there was a sword wound that got infected, and this is what ultimately killed him when he was on his way back to Rome to receive his pardon. And when he died, um, were there a lot of, of his paintings you know, I know a lot of the paintings had been commissioned, so they were in X or Y place, whether that was a church or somebody's private home. Were there a lot of loose paintings floating around and, and then an attempt, an attempt to quickly kind of get them all in order? Uh, there was an attempt to quickly grab them because of their value. His work was still highly sought after. He was, his his fame had not, you know, diminished by at this point. This came later when the the biographies from, uh, you know, enemies and competitors started to to come out. 
Um, at the time that he died, he was still highly sought after as an artist, and uh, the few paintings he had with him, uh, there, you know, there's a scuffle. P uh, Peter Robb talks about this uh, extensively in his book, um, about the scramble to grab as many of his paintings as possible once it was realized that there wouldn't be any more. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, okay, we have one more quick question from Sheila and then a comment from uh, Betty, who I know you, you know Betty well, Nella. Um, so let me get to que uh, Sheila's question. Um, but as this takes us back to the cinema, uh, was a Caravaggio painting featured in the film The English Patient? There was a character named Caravaggio. Yes, that's actually a, um, a book uh, by Michael Londace. Uh, he he has this uh, Caravaggio. It's not the same Caravaggio. It's a, it's a, it's a, okay. an Italian Canadian guy in Michael Londace's books, whose name is whose last name is Caravaggio. Yeah, there's there's no connection there. I don't. You know, it's been a long time since I saw the film, and I don't remember if there was a painting uh, in the English Patient film. Good question. Yeah. I'm sorry. I don't know the answer. I'm not sure either, to be honest. I'm trying to think of the different settings in the film. Yeah, I might yeah. go back and have another look at it. Um, and just a final comment from uh, from Betty, who I know has traveled with Nella before. Um, Hi, Betty. She's uh, yeah, she's recommending everyone see the uh, the painting of the Corporal Works of Mercy which is in Naples. Where exactly in Naples is that, Nella? You know? um, it's in, uh, uh, is it in a church? It's in a church that's actually more of an art gallery than a church. It's got some amazing pieces in it. It's small. I honestly don't remember the name off the top of my head, but you can't miss it. Uh, if you look uh, in the uh, Caravaggio website, it'll it'll be easy to find that, uh, that uh, picture and uh, the location. Let me see if I can just quickly find it uh, here in the Peter Rob book in the list that he's got but it is an amazing work and uh, um, you know even looking at reproductions of it will be uh, quite astounding one of the interesting things is that when we did uh, when we did the Elena Ferrante uh, trip we actually went to to this church this chapel and looked at the artworks and what was interesting is that uh, this uh, famous work of Caravaggio's, it's a huge piece. It's, it takes up an entire wall, as I recall. Um, there was an older work of art that was on exhibit, and I can't remember if it was a sculpture or a smaller painting, but it was definitely uh, earlier and more primitive in terms of its, uh, its execution, but it had the same theme. It had the same theme, and, and particularly what I think is one of the most riveting elements in the painting, uh, the daughter who is giving a drink to her elderly father from her breast, right, the milk from her breast. So, um, yeah, it's an amazing work, Betty, as, as I'm, I'm sure you know from your recommendation. And I'm just quickly trying to find the name. Um, I don't want to mess with my computer because it might mess up something, but you can quickly Google it and find the name of that of that chapel that uh, where that piece is. Sorry. Yeah, that's okay. And we'll all include it in the follow up as well. This is the painting, the corporal. I, I don't know the the corporal. Ugh, I suddenly cannot cannot talk anymore. Corporal works. Corporal works of mercy. Um, and we'll include seven. the. Normally, it's referred to as the seven works of mercy. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, and we'll include all of this and more in the in the follow up um, email along with the recording. Um, just wanted to thank Nella. That was fantastic. My I pleasure. learned so much. Really, really, really fascinating. And um, get, you know, you it's easy to kind of stay on the surface, right? Of the the turbulence of of Caravaggio's life and I, I liked how you made us maybe think a little deeper about his own interior conflicts and what was happening for him. Um, so thank you so much Nala. Thank you so much. Um, thank you everyone for being here and uh, I misspoke earlier. We'll be back on uh, February 17th, not March 17th. Uh, February 17th I'll be talking about Paul Bowles in Morocco and then in March we have um, 
Mark Swick talking about uh, led, uh, myths in Sicily. And in April, we have Sean Forrester talking about um, a Dutch and Flemish masters as part of his trip in fall 2022. Um, so lots more to come and we'll look forward to seeing you, seeing you there. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Nella. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you. Have a good day, everybody. Bye-bye. Be well. Yeah.